Hello everyone and welcome to the first Scotsway podcast of 2022 and I'm joined by journalist and music writer Graham Thompson. Hello Graham. Hi Alistair, how are you? I'm very well thanks, I'm very well and I'm going to be talking to Graham about his latest book Themes for Great Cities A New History of Simple Minds which is a terrific account of the early years of one of Scotland's greatest bands and if you're watching the video I've got the book with me there. So first question I want to ask Graham is why did you think there was a need for a new history of Simple Minds? Do you think there were stories yet to be told? I'm not even sure if it was stories. I just felt there was a kind of uh, a re-evaluation or a recalibration maybe of where they stand um, in the landscape really. And I, it was funny, I was at the the Rip It Up exhibition. I don't know if you went to that at the, yes. at the National Museum a few years back. And I thought a lot of it was very good and some of it was kind of betrayed the difficulty of trying to fit so much in. We've got such a rich musical culture, I think, in this country. But I was struck by how um, kind of paltry the Simple Minds exhibit was. And I was struck by probably someone had a problem with where, where to put them, you know, because they, they've, as I, as I say in the book, they've been many different bands. And sometimes we think because the name of a band stays the same, that, that it's kind of the same band all the way through. And, and for me, I think they're a good example of a band who, who changed so much that there were almost three or four different bands. Um, so I, I thought, I saw that exhibition and thought, actually, there's a lot more I think still needs to be said about this group. And also, you know, I'd written, my previous books were about quite kind of volatile individuals, you know, kind of eccentric, prodigal creatives. And I, and I wanted to write a bit more about the creative collective and that dynamic of how a young band kind of makes its mark and makes its music. Um, so all those thoughts were percolating around and I did want to get the band involved. I didn't want to write an authorised book because I think they can be a bit stayed, but I did want their input and that took a little bit of time just to kind of put those pieces together. I think that's a really interesting point because when I was thinking about doing this interview, I was thinking about histories, particularly I think of Glasgow bands, but you could say Scottish bands in general, as you're saying. And in the 80s, you know, people like to categorise. So you've got postcard, then the kind of blue-eyed soul of Deacon Blue and Hipsway and all that. And then they kind of move into the indie bands of BMX Bandits, Teenage Fan Club, Pastels, etc. And of course, Simple Vines don't fit in any of those categories. There's not a simple place for them to sit. And I think partly that's timing. But I think, as you say, it's partly because they change so much over a really short period of time that they don't sit with anyone. They don't even sit with themselves. That's so true. And I think, you know, Postcard does loom extremely large over the, the, the Scottish kind of post-punk uh, landscape, and deservedly so in some ways, but I do think it, it, it's kind of overshadowed what came immediately before that. And I understand it because the Postcard aesthetic, I think, is very attractive. And a lot of those bands didn't last all that long. And that, I think that's the other thing with Simple Minds is, is they lasted so, you know, they've been around so long that we almost take them for granted. Whereas a lot of those bands didn't last very long. They maybe made one album or two albums. And it's very, it's much easier to kind of get a handle on that. And also to, to kind of deify it in a way or to romanticize it uh, beyond perhaps its influence. And, uh, you know, every cult has its own orthodoxies as well. You know, every niche now kind of has its own, um, it's kind of its own prepared story. And, and I think, it's very interesting now then to look back at a band that did become enormous and kind of work out where they do fit or if indeed they don't fit that's fine too um but i, I do think that they were incredibly influential and it's one of the reasons i wanted to speak to people like <clears throat> bobby gillespie and people who came afterwards uh, to talk about how how they did influence the next the next generation of bands by, the, by that point of course they've moved on they've become something completely different and, and, and an international band not not a local band and I wonder why I wonder if that's also something to do with it as well that we didn't stay a local Glasgow band very long I think you know you've got these chapters that you get they're called love songs which you know people look back at their the influence that they had but I thought choosing those two in particular Bobby Gillespie and James Dean Bradfield uh, of Manic Street Preachers because they're two bands I would say that are at least two people that shared the ambition they wanted to be huge they kind of almost said it in their own kind of mission statement, particularly Manic Street Preachers, that we want to be, we want to take on the world. Exactly, not scared of success, but also 
there's a kind of subversive intent in both those bands as well. They wanted to do something quite interesting with their success and with their music and something quite intellectually interesting and always changing their sound. So I think you can see, uh, certainly you can see connections there with, with early Simple Minds. Absolutely, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. Two bands who their second, third and fourth albums are so different from the first album that they kind of put out and done over a fairly short period of time as well. Yeah, and occasionally, you know, they don't mind scaring the horses. They will make quite experimental records and quite interesting concepts and then kind of come back into the mainstream fold. And, and yeah, so that, I, did, I did want those kind of artists to talk about how Simple Minds sort of affected that, that worldview. So what is it for you about those early Simple Minds albums that kind of um, made such a great impression? God, so, well, what we've just talked about, I think the fact that they, they change so much, you know, that they are from Life in a Day to Real to Real to Coffee, Empires and Dance, Sons of Fascination, You Go Dream. Um, none of those records really sound alike. And yet it's demonstrably this, the work of the same band, I think. You know, you can hear what the kind of fundamental elements are. Um, and I was fascinated by the way they wrote, you know, that, that, that huge kind of improvisational churn that, kept, that brought that music around. Yeah. And the fact that, the fact that they had a singer who couldn't play anything and, and kind of dreamed up um, these songs while listening to these huge long jams, uh, you know, three or four hour jams of music. I thought it was quite an interesting and unusual way of, of working, very labor intensive in a way, but also very, um, you know, combustible. You know, it, it, it's it's something that, that that that's not it's not given permission for. You know, it, I felt it was something that was quite just quite unusual. Um, and I think you can hear that in those songs. The fact that there aren't loads of offcuts, there aren't loads of outtakes from Simple Minds at that period, because everything kind of gets con condensed very densely into each song. Um, and just the rhythm, you know, there, there aren't many bands at, at that time who were making that kind of rhythmic noise. Yeah. And we have to talk about Derek Forbes, but we also have to talk about Brian McGee, because I think that, you know, the drums are really, really important. Sometimes it's overlooked. I do make the case in the book, you know, people always talk about when Derek Forbes, the bass player, leaves, that everything kind of falls apart for Simple Minds, which is not true anyway. But I think the fact that when Brian McGee left in 1981, uh, that was a huge thing, you know, that, that rhythmic bottom of, of, of their songs changed dramatically. Um, so, yeah, so, so much interesting. And then you have Jim Kerr, who's this kind of um, alien presence, you know, he's just picking up these lines. None of it's really linear. None of it makes a huge amount of narrative sense. But I think you always kind of get a, an idea of the atmosphere of the song, and what, he's, what he's trying to, what mood he's trying to create. Very filmic. Um, and I think they stand up really well. You know, I, I think those albums still stand up really well. And I like the fact that they haven't really been canonized. You know, they don't appear in the top 500 British albums of all time. New Gold Dream perhaps does, but yeah. um, Empires and Dance should be, you know, that should be in there pretty high. And it still is a marginal record. And, and I, I like that. But at the same time, I suppose I am wanting to throw a bit of a light on it as well. It's so interesting. Those um, albums that you mentioned just for people who don't know, were made over a five year period, 79, Life in a Day to, um, well, New Gold Dream was 82, was it? Is that right? So even I mean, less than that, three years, is that right? Even though I'm saying it out loud, I'm having to check, but it is because Sparkle in the Rain was 1984. So, I mean, if you think how long it took, for instance, um, fellow Glasgow band, the Blue Nile, I think it was about seven years or something before they made their follow-up. And I know that's taken it to the extreme, but as you say, the work ethic, the almost industrial way of making music over mm -hmm. that period to, to make all of these records that um, were incredibly different. And for people who don't know them that well, you know, if they listen to them now, they'll think, well, there's, there's disco in there, there's dance of the time, there's you know, um, kraut rock. There's all these incredible influences that they just seem to be taking on like sponges. I think that's it. I think it's it's very unreflective. You know, it, it's it's make and move, tour, record, go and do it again, but do it differently every time. And it is that idea of soaking up. You know, what's getting played on the the dance floors in, in Dusseldorf when you're on tour or in Berlin. Um, 
what's getting played in New York and the clubs there when you when you're you know buzzing through there for a couple of days, and just throw it all into the pot. And you had musicians who were able to do that. Um, but like you say, I mean, it's, it, it's six albums. If, if we count, they made that kind of quasi double album, Sons of Fascination, Sister Feelings Call. Six albums in three and a half years. It, it's a kind of astonishing um, output. And um, it does cover a huge amount of ground. Um, and there's nothing kind of gratuitously pretty in there. There's nothing particularly jangly in there. You know, we associate Glasgow, I think, post that period with the, the 12 string guitar and the jangle, the Californian. This is very European. It's very uh, un-American. It's looking kind of in your own backyard for inspiration. And I like that about them too. Um, and I think what they eventually do is they realize that actually Glasgow is a part of that. You know, it's, it's part of the European tradition. It's part of Berlin and it's part of Paris and it's part of, you know, all these cities that they're moving through. Um, and I find that very interesting culturally, you know, these five working class people who kind of do, do become appreciative of, of the richness of their own culture. Well, it, it didn't strike me till reading the book just how much of their music did reflect what the city and where they were from. And, and in, a, in a similar way, actually, to the Blue Nile do with Walk Across the Rooftops. And, uh, uh, um, you know, they, they are letting the city, they start to let the city influence them. And I was put in mind of that famous Alistair Gray quote about, you know, a city doesn't exist till people think of it imaginatively. And that's what they're doing. I mean, they're looking out there from a place quite near where I grew up. Uh, they were from Tory Glen and those kind of areas and I was from Cambus Lang. So that kind of view over Glasgow that they had um, was kind of quite familiar. And they went to the kind of post-industrial places as well. They saw kind of beauty in these places too. I think so. And then you hear a song like Waterfront, which, you know, is I suppose, towards the end of this period that we're talking about, when they're kind of bursting out into a much bigger uh, aesthetic. But, you know, that is a that is a reclamation of Glasgow as, as a as a living thing, as, you know, despite what's going on at that time in the 80s and the Thatcherite, you know, induced decline of the shipyards and all that. Um, it is, I think that's a very political song. Uh, you know, it, it sounds very powerful and it's kind of reclaiming the river and the riverside and, and Clydeside as something that's, that's still worth something. So yeah, it's absolutely true. I, I do think, and I wanted to establish it quite early on in the book that, you know, where they come from um, is, is hugely important to the music. And they, you know, they talked about, they went on these hitchhiking trips just prior to, to forming Simple Minds. Charlie and Jim went off to Europe and Northern Italy and it's a purely imaginative act going there and seeing um, what the world can be and coming back to your own city, I think, is, is hugely significant. And just that expansion of your horizons. Um, it's very romantic and I think it's very, it's very interesting. It is, and it's kind of very brave and confident for people. We're talking about really young guys, you know, who just decide, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take off. And, and, and see, you know, how far we get and what, what influences us. Hugely. And I think Jim Kerr is really, really important in that and having that the, the kind of vision. Um, pretensions, of course, you know, delusions, probably, but also the vision of being, yeah, we can actually do this. Um, and I think that's where punk is important in their story, which, you know, um, they were briefly in Johnny and the Self Abusers, which was a kind of a fleeting punk band, but. Um, I think it was more significant to them just breaking down that idea of what you can and can't do as a working class boy from Tory Glen. You know, it gave them a sense of permission that you can actually go out there and, and do this and grab those pretensions and, you know, write about that play that you, you kind of half remember or that book that you've half read. Um, I, I like that, that kind of autodidactic idea of just chucking everything in. It, you know, it happened with the music and it also happens with the, the lyrics and, and the kind of imagery. It's all... It's all kind of chancing it a little bit, but it, but it, it works because you, you have the belief behind it. Yeah, and going back to that amount of albums made over such a short period of time, I mean, even back then, it was really difficult to get an album made. So, you know, to have the, the kind of musical backing or for people to back you to say, yeah, we're going to fund album after album after album, and they're all completely different to the one that went before. I mean, it, it's a leap of faith for nearly everyone involved. 
Yeah, and it was it was touch and go for a long time. I mean, those first three records didn't really sell anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they were on Arista, who were kind of an old school, who were quite a hip record label in America, but in Britain were kind of, you know, they had Shawadi Wadi and, and, and bands like that. You know, they weren't at the cutting edge and they were an old school record company, kind of patrician. Um, so it was always touch and go, those first three records, and they never got really the promotion they, they merited. And I don't think they were ever particularly understood. And, but we see it when, when they move to Virgin on the fourth record, I think that's when things start to move for them. You know, they're in a more progressive um, environment. People who understand them a bit better. Even then, it took a while. Yeah. You, know, you listen to the American or, or Love Song, and you think those, those could have been quite substantial hits, but, but they weren't. You know, they were sort of in the 50s and 40s and scrabbling around at the wrong end of Top of the Pops. So that's the other thing that, that interested me, I think, because you couldn't, a, bands don't work like this now. I mean, you don't really get five-piece bands that make music this way. But also, they wouldn't be allowed to to grow in that way, I think, anymore. Yeah. You know, you, if you had four or five records that didn't, uh, that weren't a success, you would be dropped, and it would be very difficult for you to continue. And the, you've mentioned kind of a little bit about the way that they worked, and I wonder if the way that they worked with, um, <clears throat> certainly with Jim Kerr going and, and doing his, his lyrics almost, isolated, we're not sharing them until the last minute with mm. the band. And even the other members of the band doing individual, you know, kind of knowing what they were good at and having a strong enough personality to make sure that gets on the record. That seems to be as important as any influences they had. Absolutely. You know, it's, like, it's a chemical thing, isn't it? Band? You know, I, I think we forget sometimes just how kind of <laughs> how unusual it is to have four or five people in a room not really knowing what they're doing. None of them really taking the lead and somehow coming out with something that's that's kind of cogent and coherent it's, it's quite an unusual way of working and, and i think it can't you know it can't last forever that and it's no surprise that it doesn't last forever but it must be incredibly exciting i think while while it's happening while you feel you're all kind of attuned on the same wavelength and you're all coming up with ideas and crucially i think you all have nothing really else in your life at that point when you're 21 or 22 you know that, that's it you're on the road you're you're making music and you put everything into it, and, and that inevitably changes. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's a really, um, it's kind of quite a moving, at, at times, uh, kind of examination of, of that connection between people who are really into it. Um, and then, you know, and then, and then it sort of combusts, because I suppose it must in some way. And um, if you take one piece out of that, and I was talking about Brian McGee, you know, you start to take elements out of that, chemical connection and it's, it's bound to change it quite dramatically and, and I think it does you know you can hear it you can hear by the time of sparkle in the rain when you have a new drummer who's really bedded in it's like a you know it's like a new world it's like a rocket taking off it's yeah. a completely it, different dynamic it really is and I, I might talk about that a, a, a bit later because that fascinates me but with you're right about the pace that they were going it seems looking back and again, I was aware of these albums coming out, but I never, because I was young at the time and time passes at a different pace when you're young, you don't think that, oh, they had an album out last year. That seems like a long time ago yeah. when you're 13, 14. But uh, um, the pace that certainly Jim and Charlie Burchill were continuing to push forward, there's going to be people that can't keep up with that. Yeah, exactly. And that's what happened. And, and you know, everyone... At the end of the day, everyone's not into it to the same extent as maybe, you know, you want them to be. You have, you have other priorities in your life. Um, and I think, that, you know, the fact that Simple Minds have been going now for 40, 43 years, I think it is, since their first gig yesterday, in fact, 43 years, in the, January the 17th, 1978. You know, to, to keep that show on the road for that long requires an incredible amount of just pure will and determination. and and focus, and not everyone's going to buy into that. Uh, yeah. I think for that length of time. So, um, and that's definitely what happened. Yeah, and and you know, Jim says in the book when I spoke to him, he, he's when Brian McGee left. You know, and Brian, I think, you know, would have probably just needed a bit of a break at that point because they were just touring constantly. And Jim was like, "Well, well, then I was like, no. Why would you want anything else out of life than what we're doing? And we're kind of on the cusp of making it." why he just couldn't work out why this guy didn't want to stay around now looking back 
which is one of the interesting things I think in the book is that they're kind of reflecting with 40 years of hindsight. He's like, yeah, I get it. You know, it's, um, it, was a, it was a completely obsessive environment. It was completely male. It was very, in many ways, unsympathetic. Um, no one was kind of hugging each other and checking that they were all right. And he's like, yeah, I get it now. Um, but back then, no, keep up or get off. There's some lovely self-reflection, a very honest reflection, I think, on the time um, from Jim Kerr, uh, particularly. And, and looking, and I think even the way that they now look back on these albums, you know, it seemed to me um, a bit like a footballer who, you know, the next game is the only one that's important. It's only when they retire they can look back in their career. Now, I know they're still going, yeah. but there does seem to be a sense of that, that they're now looking back and re-examining these albums for themselves, because almost it was... It was the next album was always the next thing for them. I certainly up until Once Upon a Time, which was eight, you know, eighty-five. So again, hardly yeah. any time after the last one. Exactly. I think it, you know, my narrative kind of finishes in eighty-five, eighty-six, because I think that's a natural arc of that initial period of the band, and, and everything pauses at that point. Um, but yeah, you, you just keep moving, and, and they did say, you know, because I, I asked them, as everyone sitting knows about Simple Minds. It's like, well, they sold out. They became a stadium rock band. They kind of took the big money. They went for it. Um, and, you know, Jim and Charlie were both like, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't really contrive that. You know, you couldn't really go for that in that way. And you didn't have the time to try and strategize about stuff like that. You know, you just played, you know, to, 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 to continue the football analogy, you know, you play who's in front of you. Yeah. And at that point, you know, they're getting more successful. The crowds are getting bigger. The rooms are getting much bigger. The drummer is getting much, much louder. <laughs> and, and so things evolve in a fairly natural way. And I, and I believe that. I didn't think they were kind of, um, you know, chasing the dollar in, in a really kind of um, Machiavellian kind of way. And also, I think after seven or eight records, you know, fair enough. Fair enough. If, if if you're actually going to get the chance to do it, and and make this your life and your career, I'm not sure anyone would really turn that opportunity down. But but you're right in saying that I, I don't think you can see that till 20, 30 yeah. years later. And then they did this very interesting tour in uh, 2012. You know when they they revisited all those early songs and played them live, the five by five yeah. tour, um, which was fascinating. And I think that was the beginning of a kind of reevaluation of that music and a, and a kind of appreciation of it and, and a sort of acknowledgement that it didn't, it wasn't admitting any kind of defeat to go back there and, and explore what those uh, songs were about. Um, so there is that reflective sort of layer to the book, which I think is quite nice. Yeah, it's interesting looking back as a, as a music fan as well to see how your own perception changed of the band. Um, I remember when You Go Dream, I think in the Melody Maker that year was either number one or number two album of the year. You know, it was it was really regarded by music fans as something very, very special. And and then it just seemed to slightly, I mean, I like Sparkle in the Rain and, and things, but it did seem to just get bigger and bigger and the kind of, there, there's something fragile still about New Gold Dream, I think, when you listen to it, which mm -hmm. kind of disappears with, with subsequent things. And you could fit it in with, I think, some of the bands you relate it to, Scritti Politti, um, some of the more interesting, slightly political pop bands that were around at that time, the, the being another one, I think. Um, but none of them, whether they didn't get the opportunity, kind of went stadium you know they never kind of maybe they didn't get the opportunity and would have but it's interesting to compare where they were with new gold dream and it does seem that um in terms of numbers and size they went like that but critically they kind of took another direction if that makes sense yeah absolutely and it, it, you know it was a time when the when the music papers had an incredible amount of power and clout and 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 used it um to their discretion and I think it's one of the reasons why I think Simple Minds, it, it sort of became very quickly Simple Minds became regarded as a very different band because they were suddenly critically kind of persona non gratis and in a way that seemed to just all those early records seemed to not matter anymore or, or that they were kind of somehow cancelled out because they've yeah. become this other kind of band and critically you couldn't really say you liked them which I think is interesting 
we're in a very different place now, I think, in terms of the music press and all that kind of stuff. And I think we're in a much more, uh, in some ways, a much more open-minded place that we can we can kind of see things a bit more clearly. But definitely there was that very steep ascent, but a huge change in sound. I mean, you think of Promise You America, which, as you say, is still quite arty and still quite dreamy and, and it's, got, it's light on its feet. Uh, and then Waterfront comes along only, you know, it's only 18 months later that that record comes out. And it's a huge, big, powerful juggernaut of a song. And it's a rock song. Yeah. Um, and they're in a completely different world, I think. And so, um, and that's it. it. You know, at that time, you know, the things are moving so fast in music that I think uh, the next thing was what was important. And Simple Minds kind of just dropped off the radar in some ways in a critical sense. And, and whether they meant it or not, it was their first real stadium song. I mean, it was the one that reached out to the back of the, 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 the larger um, venues. And of course, it had um, Mel Gaynor. Now, I'm interested about Mel Gaynor because I think I did realise, but never thought about it clearly, that his arrival as this tremendous and loud drummer really did change their sound. And I remember when I saw them live a few times in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s, he was always introduced as Mel Gaynor, the best young drummer in the world. That's how Jim always used to, <laughs> you know, introduce yeah. him. But when you listen to Sparkle in the Rain and, and tracks like Waterfront stuff, the drumming is massive and completely changes their sound. Astonishing. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, Sparkle in the Rain starts with with four clicks on the drumsticks. You know, and that's no that's no it's no coincidence. You know, it's it's an announcement of some sort. He's an amazing drummer. Um, and of course, he is our New Gold Dream, but but he came in halfway through New Gold Dream, and the parts had already been, you know, been set really for those songs. So he's playing much more as a session man on that album, on the on the tracks that he plays on. It's, you know, he's not asserting his his kind of musical identity on that record. Um, you know, Jim likened it to, to you know to someone lifting you six feet off the ground on stage, having Mel Gainer behind you, it, it, and so. I think inevitably the vocals become a bit more strident, a bit louder. Um, yeah. The bass is kind of trying to trying to compete, so it's becoming much more powerful. Um, and they're also starting to play festivals. You know, Waterfront. The first time they played Waterfront was at Phoenix Park. They were playing with U2 uh, in 1983. So you need songs that are going to fill, you know, fill that space. And I think, you know, Premonition and Sweat and Bullet ne aren't necessarily going to go over. Yeah. Um, to 15,000 people in a race ground somewhere. Um, and Mick McNeil says that in the book, you know, he says you start writing stuff that's that's maybe half the speed because it, if you play too fast outside, you know, it sounds like mush, it doesn't doesn't go over. So you, you start to write with those kind of things in mind. And of course that, that has a massive effect. And um, so you hear that on Spark on the Rain and you hear it on Once Upon a Time, you know, it's much more mid-paced, punchy, um, uncomplicated, I suppose. And I think um, the, the the lyrics almost have to change there as well, because previously they were very literary and uh, referential, and to get them all, you really had to listen quite closely. And then again, for the same reasons that you just said, what you want is anthemic, and anthemic tends to be simple sing along lyrics. There's, there's a great there's a great line in the book where um, they're writing alive and kicking. And uh, they're working with Jimmy Iovine, who's the, you know this big American producer who's worked with Bruce Springsteen and Patti Smith. And Jim starts singing "Alive and Kicking," and, he's, and the first line is "You turn me on," and he says, "Don't, don't worry, I'll you know I'll fix that." And Jimmy Iovine goes, "No, no, no, you won't. That's that's perfect." Um, and so that's kind of indicative of the big the change that you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's what what's you know, what cuts through, what's more, uh, what's easy to connect to people. But also I think, you know, Jim had used that sort of jump cut, you know, Polaroid thing for quite a few records. And I, I guess you do as a writer become, you know, you want to challenge yourself and you want to do something a little bit different. And, and Charlie, you know, said the same thing. He said, you know, we wanted to start writing songs that people could actually sing, you know, the, the proper songs that, that actually work as pieces of, coherent music so I suppose there is a there's a kind of challenge to yourself as a, as a musician that you want to do things that are different from what you've done before and when you've been very abstract and been very kind of alienated and been very cool 
I suppose that the, the revolution or the revolutionary act is to go to go mainstream, you know, the yeah. weird turn pro, as, as Hunter S. Thompson said. So I think it's, you know, you can kind of see it from, from still from a creative view that they're actually still taking risks for themselves. You know, they're trying to do something different than they did before. And I think there is a bit of that in, in those records. And do you think, um, I mean, it's, it's mentioned quite a bit in the book, but do you think that the recording of Don't You Forget About Me almost kind of showed them the way to do that? In actual fact, it was recorded very quickly. It wasn't their song, but, and they weren't, they weren't keen on doing it. However, you know, it's almost the archetypical sing along, punch the air, all that kind of stuff song. Yeah, I think that's very true. Yeah, they were very reluctant to do it because they didn't do other people's songs and they felt kind of pressurized into it by the American record company. Um, but yes, I think you're right. You know, they, 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 if you hear the demo of that song, they did an awful lot to it very quickly and they worked it up but i think it was a kind of master class in how you can make really clean radio pop rock music how you produce it how you structure it it's not uh, i mean sparkle in the rain is it's huge production wise don't you forget about me isn't actually it's quite it's quite clean and quite yeah. focused um and yeah i think you can hear that although they've written most of the songs for once upon a time Prior to that, I do think you can hear them kind of learning the lesson of how you make this kind of music and make it cut through. Yeah, because I just think that the earlier uh, Simple Minds or the, the younger Jim Kerr to sing lines like, hey, 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 whoa, 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 you know, he was saying, oh, no, no, that's not for me. But, you know, it works for that song and actually went on to work for them, and you know, hugely. Yeah, well, there's a great story where, where they're recording it and uh, Keith Forsey, who, who wrote the song, co-wrote the song, and Jim's going, look, I'm, I won't sing la, 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 la at the end. I, I don't do that. That's not me. You know, he goes, you go and, go and have a cup of tea and I'm going to get some stuff down for the end, for the outro that's going to knock your socks off. And uh, so they all go off. Jim puts down this kind of stream of consciousness and everyone comes in and goes, what? Fuck is that? <laughs> no, we're not, we're not using that. And Jim goes, no, we'll, we'll stick with la, 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 la. And I think, that, you know, Again, it's what works for, for, for the song and, and what would have worked two years ago doesn't work now. It, it's horses for courses, I guess. And yeah, they bought into that. There's no question they bought into that. And, and that song was an unexpected success. You know, Jim likened it to a deflection. You know, it's a 40 yard free kick that, that takes a, a huge deflection that was in the top corner and suddenly you're stars. And suddenly, ev you know, everything changes. Number one in America. Um, so yeah, that, that's how it can happen sometimes, I guess. Yeah, am I right in thinking it was offered to other people before they took it? I've got a thing in my memory well, of um, Echo and the Bunnymen, but I might be wrong about that. Well, it was, I believe it, it was written with Simple Minds in, in, in mind because he was a huge fan, but then when they were dithering, it got offered to Psychedelic Furs, I think it was, and also Brian Ferry, I think, um, wow. who both, and the demo's very Psychedelic furs -y. It's got that kind of drawl. Uh, Richard Butler draw, um, and they were they weren't keen at all. Um, but eventually, I think because they've been neglected in America for so long, and now they were being offered a shot, and and a lot of pressure bore down eventually from A and M in America, saying, "Look, this is your big chance. Um, we'd really like you to do it." And 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 they did it, and that's it. You know, life changing. So when you were talking to them about the really early albums, um. I take it there was a great fondness for them that, and those times, because it's a bit like now, you know, looking back in your school days or your university days or whatever, for them, that was when they were young and partly carefree and just doing what they wanted to do. Definitely. No, very, very fond and very, I think very, very fond of the way they worked. You know, I, I felt that, that certainly Charlie would love to, I think, still be in a collective where he could bounce musical ideas off um, other sort of like-minded people. I, I got the sense that he would have liked that. I'm certainly very um, thought back very fondly to how they made music back then. Um, Jim likewise, but I think he sees it as, as a little bit more abstract, you know, and um, and I, I guess because he's slightly outside of the process, you know, and I, I think the certainly lyrically it's, it's stuff that he probably has grown out of in, in many ways. You know, he sees it um, as the sort of abstractions of a of a young 
fast mind. Um, he was still trying to find his voice. Uh, and he said that to me, you know, New Gold Dream was the album he felt that finally Simple Minds had become something that sort of transcended their influences. So I think he sees those records as quite derivative, I guess, because he knows what went into them. I yeah. think when we listen to them, they don't sound really derivative at all because there's so much going on um, that whatever influences they were making from, um, once you blend them all together, they sound kind of quite extraordinary. Um, but I did, I said to Charlie, like, well, you know, how about a, a theme tour of Empires and Dance, you know, and he just went, I really don't think, <laughs> I don't think there's a market for that. Uh, you know, I beg to differ, but but um, maybe not. You know, it's quite, uh, there's a lot of strange music on that record. Yeah, I'd be interested to see how they would create it in a larger place on stage oh, God, yeah. now. But I think it's so interesting that talking to people about Simple Minds now, they often, that's what they do. They go back to those early albums. They, they maybe go back to New Gold Dream, but they do go back to the, the earlier songs and the American and Love Song. You know, they're still... They're the, ironically, they're the ones that have held up. You wouldn't necessarily put on Street Fighting Years or, um, I don't even know some of the, the, the later ones, and, and uh, uh, sit down and listen to them. But I have, in fact, I ordered a vinyl copy of New Gold Dream after list because I'd, I'd lost mine from years and years ago after yeah. it, because it just, it. that's such a great record. I just want to hear it as it was supposed to be heard in the first place. I think also they were they were fortunate or just or shows well, they, they worked with really good people, you know, the yeah. producers on those records. John Leckie is a, you know, is a legend. Um, and Steve Hillage, an inspired kind of left field choice to make those uh, songs in fascination. And then Peter Walsh, who's, a, who's another fantastic um, producer, engineer. Um, so they had really good people um, facilitating their vision and making them sound great. They still sound great. You know, even New Gold Dream, which is an, I suppose an eighties record, doesn't, start, doesn't, fall into the trappings that we might expect of you know some of the worst excesses of 80s production. It doesn't have any of that on it at all. It's still completely kind of light and timeless. Um, mm, absolutely. Uh, and, and, the, and the ones before that are just re are really crisp and, and punchy and wonderful, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right about the people that they worked with. What came across is they were really open to working with different people mm -hmm. because these producers were kind of offered up to them and they could easily have said, oh no, 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 we'll do this. We, we'll stick with what we know. But they were looking to kind of change and do new things through the producers that they worked with. And also, I think, you know, because, you know, the first album, Life in a Day, it doesn't quite fly. You know, it's, it's not a bad record and it's got some good songs in it, but it's a bit, it's a bit tame, I think, and a bit hemmed in. And I think, you know, Jim and Charlie deserve quite a lot of credit because that album is a, is a kind of co-written record between the two of them. It's, it's, songs they wrote in their bedrooms in, in, in Tory Glen, you know, the old school guitar and vocal. And, and they dumped that, you know, they, they dumped that way of working, um, which I think is quite unusual, you know, just to say, right, we're not going to just write those conventional songs now, we're just going to bring everybody in to the creative process and see what happens. Um, I think that's quite, that's quite brave. And, and, you know, the album that comes after that, Real to Real Cacophony, is... It's a very odd record, but yeah. it's it's a real beacon of sort of collective democratic creativity. Yeah, I mean, I think anyone listening to this who are not familiar with those early albums, do check them out because they will surprise you. If nothing else, okay. they will really, really surprise you if you think, oh, this is the band that did Don't You Forget About Me or, or you know, Mandela Day or something like that. Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned that you'd written previous books, um, I think Kate Bush, George Harrison, John Martin. How do you choose who you're going to, to, to write about? Well, it, it varies. I mean, it's always got, it's got to start, I think, with um, the substance of the music. I mean, in this case, it, it's a no-brainer. It's a book I've wanted to write for a very, very long time. Um, without some of the other, Kate Bush is the same. Um, so it's a balance, I guess, between recognizing substance in the music. Sometimes there are artists who are, who are very much a kind of pillar of my record collection, and I listen to, and I've listened to for many years. Um, some less so, you know, someone like Phil Ryan of Thin Lizzy, who you know wouldn't be someone who I've got huge record amount of records by originally. But I think um, 
the other side of the equation is someone who's got an interesting yeah. uh, story to tell and, and who's and whose life story somehow is fed into the create creativity you know that you can you can look at the life and look at the music and somehow it, you can kind of forge a path through that that hopefully you know enlightens people who who like that music you know, who, who will understand a little bit more or appreciate a bit more about where it comes from uh, the depth of it um so that yeah that that's that's kind of it um you know there are people you might want to write about where there's just there isn't really a commercial viability to do so there's people who have got lots and lots and lots of books written about them and there's in some ways less to say but i think you know now it's not so much about the information i think because you know in, in our current overload information age you know pretty much everything we know about bands is out there um, yeah. or artists there's no great revelations really anymore so it's more about the story you want to tell i think and i, I like that i think it, it, it gives you a bit more freedom now to to write um, in a wider way about artists that you admire, not have to kind of offer the great reveal about, oh, well, we didn't know this existed or we didn't know that this happened. I think we're past that now, really, as a kind of culture of music. I think most of it's fairly well mapped out. So it's about how you want to explore that territory. Yeah, all the kind of anecdotes and, and little stories are, are out there for people to have found already. And I think that's one of the great things about um, themes for great cities is by getting the people who were there to talk, you do get that kind of in, in, inside um, track on it that you may not have got otherwise. Good, yeah, I hope so. I, I really wanted to get all the all the kind of all the stories down, but no, I didn't want it to be kind of filled with sort of tour stories and battle stories and war stories. You know, I, I wanted it to be uh, it's primarily about the music and about how the music came about and. The people that made it and um, what they feel about it, and what they felt about it then, and how they feel about it now. Um, and I think we're getting to that stage now where these bands have been together so long that it, it is now worth asking, what, what do you think about, you know, what, where you've been and what you've done? And, um, and it's, you know, it does stop in about 1986, but it's not really a, you know, it's not a repudiation of everything they've done since then at all. It, it's, um, it's just that that felt to me like a, a kind of a story in itself, a story arc in itself. Um, and it does link to where they are now. And there is a sort of coda at the end of the book that sort of brings it up to date, I think. But um, it's about finding that sort of narrative within the, the bigger picture, I think. It's quite interesting. And I think because all the albums that you do touch upon, apart from the very first one, 79, they, they were a band of the 80s, but yet, and as we said, right at the very beginning, unlike kind of any other band of the 80s, and, and you know, uh, that's almost what defined them. And maybe it goes back yeah. to the thing about when you went to the um, a Rip It Up exhibition and there wasn't a huge thing to them, is that they just do not fit in to any easy narrative. They don't. I, I, don't, I still don't think they do fit. I don't know where they do fit, and I, I, quite, I quite like that. Um, that they aren't kind of easy to categorize and they didn't have a finite lifespan or a nice little neat niche. Um, that's good. I like that. That's kind of messy and, and that it's, um, it's difficult to pin down. But I don't think that doesn't mean we can't kind of shine a light on it and say, well, look, whatever this, whatever this is, <laughs> wherever it fits, it's, it's amazing music. You know, it's, 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 yeah. it's worth celebrating still. And I think it still sounds, um, incredibly fresh yeah well like all the best music books it sent me back to the music which i think is, is part of the the job <laughs> of a music That's book good. Yep. um do you have anyone in mind for your next book or is that a secret at the moment or do you have anyone who nope. you really ideally write to like to write about well my next i'm going to write about the band uh, talk talk for my next book um but again uh, kind of a progression, I guess, on this kind of thing. It's it's about the four, well, the three last Talk Talk records and, and the last solo record by Mark Hollis. And it's it will be more, again, more music based and more kind of uh, reflective um, on, I suppose, my feelings towards that music and not so much of the kind of biographical. Right. Um, I think they, they sort of defy the biographer 
uh, that band in many ways. Uh, and another band who changed, you know, changed dramatically from the beginning of the 80s to the end, you know, a completely different proposition. Um, yeah, they almost flipped what Simple Minds did on their head because they started as a fairly straightforward meat and potatoes pop band and then became this incredible ethereal um, makers of music. Yeah, and almost a kind of imaginary, you know, stopped, stopped playing live, this kind of imaginary band, almost a conceptual idea with all these musicians under this umbrella. Um, but made the most extraordinarily kind of uh, expressive and um, uncategor uncategorizable music. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking forward to, to, to those. Are, and that, that's you know purely kind of coming out of my record collection. Really, those are records Excellent. that I've loved for a long time. So I'm looking forward to immersing myself again in those and trying somehow to kind of uh, articulate what it is about them that's so extraordinary. Fantastic. Oh, I look forward to reading that. That sounds great. Graham, thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat. I appreciate it so much. It's my pleasure, absolute pleasure. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. <laughs>